Victoria 3 is a massively complicated game with some of the most in-depth financial simulation I've ever seen. At times it feels like you can need degrees in finance and political science to understand what's even happening, but once you grasp it, you can have some real fun min-maxing your country to become the best in the world. Now initially, I went into writing this video with the intention of making a complete beginner's guide, like I did with Stellaris. But it turns out this game is somehow even more complicated, so I've had to make it into a series rather than a single 4 hour long video. Now once the series is complete, I may make it all into one super video, but for now, let's start with the basics you need to even understand what's going on. In this video, I'm going to go over setting up your game, the many resources in-game, and the entire user interface so you know what every button and resource is for. So of course, before you start playing, you need to set up your new game. Clicking new game brings you to this screen where you have a few options. You can choose from one of four set game scenarios or head straight into a sandbox where you can play however you want without much guidance. The four scenarios kind of have some set objectives for you to follow that will help you learn the game in different playstyles. To start out with, I'd recommend the learn the game scenario since it'll give you a boatload of information to help get you started and well, learn the game. Don't get me wrong, the tutorial is still super confusing, but at least you'll start picking up bits and pieces from the barrage of tooltips it throws at you. There are four recommended countries for this scenario, but if you really want, you can pick any country you want. To start with, I'd stick to Sweden since they are pretty middle of the road for basically everything, so we'll let you try out most things without too much trouble. By default, this scenario drops AI aggression a little to make things easier to get under control without worrying about someone coming to steamroll you five minutes in. You can tweak these settings and more in the game rules menu, including enabling achievements and Iron Man mode. Since we're just learning, I'd avoid Iron Man mode since chances are we'll make some mistakes we want to erase with a tactical save scum. Okay, now we've gone through all of this, we're ready to get into the game. Similar to Stellaris, Victoria has one of the most initially confusing user interfaces I've ever seen. Loading into this can make you want to all F4 and head straight to the Steam refund page, but it's not quite as bad as it looks once you get a very basic understanding. Now, before you do anything, you need to familiarise yourself with what each button does and whatever resource means, and most importantly, which ones you need to keep a closer eye on. The most important stuff is in the top left. Here you have your country's flag, and from here you can see a compact breakdown of your country and how it's doing. You have your power rank, your GDP, more about your culture, power, and status. I'll explain what all of these acronyms and words mean a little bit later on, since pretty much all of these things have their own deep menus. Clicking on the flag will take you to the country's page, where you can see all this information in more detail, as well as other effects such as their diplomacy and various modifiers. To the right of the flag, you have where you'll spend most of your time staring. The top row houses your country's primary resources, and these all fund pretty much every single action you can make. Bureaucracy is your country's capacity to maintain administrative actions, and while that sounds super complicated and a little bit boring, all it means is certain actions such as trade routes and public service funding require this to keep working as intended. The resource works on a capacity system, so rather than stockpiling it and then spending it, increasing production, which can be done by building and upgrading government administration buildings, increases the capacity, allowing you to perform more actions. Basically, as long as you're in the green, you're all good. Now you won't instantly lose the game if you go into the red, but you'll face penalties from being unable to stay on top of what's going on, like reduced tax and trade income, so get it into the green as soon as possible. Authority works on the same capacity based system, and is also used for actions that affect your country, but these are more grand scale, whereas bureaucracy was more day to day. With it, you can issue decrees, manage interest groups, and more, which we'll cover in more detail later. Influence, again, is a capacity resource and is used for diplomatic actions with other countries. These can be things such as pacts and agreements, as well as plays which are slightly ballsier actions, intending to put you directly ahead of another country. Finally, we have money, and this is the one currency that is actually earned and spent. This is by far the resource used and created by the most things, but the upside is that means there's not much else you need to manage quite as diligently. You gain income from taxes and tariffs which are generated by your own population and trading respectively, it's then consumed by government and military buildings and wages, since they can't really turn a profit. This might not sound like a lot, but within these taxes and tariffs, you have tens of resources to manage that contribute to this total. This also has an upper limit on how much you can have in reserve, so if you're getting close to maxing it out, try to increase spending since having too much cash sat around doesn't do anything for anyone. And also, any income that you get over your max storage is just going to disappear, so it's a massive waste of money. On the bottom row of this, you have some numbers which are also important to keep an eye on, but are generally managed more indirectly. First, you have gross domestic product, or GDP. This is displayed as a total and per capita. This is pretty much how rich your country is and its people are, and is worked out by taking every good you produce and multiplying it by the market price. So, for example, if you have five people who produce two wood, and wood sells for 5, then your GDP would be 10, and per capita would be 2. Literacy is the percentage of your population that can read and write. This can affect what kinds of jobs your people can work, as well as the amount of innovation generated, which is then spent on research. You also gain a small amount of passive research on random low-level text from your literacy rate, due to text spreading from nearby countries. The standard of living, of course, tells you the average quality of life of your population. This is separated into three stratas, which are basically the education-slash-wealth tiers of your population. 
You want to keep this as high as possible by ensuring your population always stays wealthy. This will increase the birth rate and mortality, meaning more pops that live longer. As well as this, it causes your population to be more loyal to you and reduce the chance of them being radicalized, which can result in revolutions. Finally, having a high standard of living increases the migration attraction, which basically means people from other countries will want to move there to get some of that good life. Next up, we have the population, and this of course, how many people live in your country's border. Generally, you want to keep this increasing, which is done by improving the standard of living, as we just said. You want to also reduce the number of unemployed people as much as possible by building workplaces where they are living. Doing this will ensure they make a wage you can tax and prevent them from emigrating to somewhere else with work for them. Finally, we have two which kind of go hand in hand, radicals and loyalists. These display the number of the aforementioned types of people. Radicals are pops unhappy with the state of their country and they bring negative effects wherever they are living. Loyalists are the opposite of radicals, so are so pleased with life that they will defend it from radicals when needed. Radicals and loyalists cannot coexist in the same region at the same time. Instead, if you have 10 radicals and gain a loyalist, you instead just lose one radical and vice versa. Just to the right of this row, we have this circular symbol. This is the list of current issues in your country or situations as they're known in game. Clicking on this will show you everything in your country that requires some immediate attention to keep you moving forward. This can be any number of things, such as having an empty construction crew, having a lack of resource in your market, or having generals and admirals idle during wartime, among many other things. If something pops up here, it's a good idea to make moves to resolve the situation as fast as possible to maintain control of the game. It's also a really handy tool for new players, as you can basically just look at this all game and fix whatever comes up, and you'll do decently well if a little passive. It's also very handy since if you hover over any of these situations, it'll give you some advice on how you can go about fixing this. Moving now down onto the left hand side. This is where you can monitor and adjust just about everything in your country. First up, we have the politics tab. From the overview tab, you can see everything going on politics wise, like your current government, its traits, any laws you have been enacted, any political movements, which are basically demands by a certain group to pass a law, and your institutions. You can also view each of these areas in more detail using the tabs along the top, which we'll come back to in a dedicated politics video. The budget tab does exactly what it says in the tin and shows you every tiny bit of income and expenditure. From here, you can set the tax level for your population, set consumption tax on certain goods, manage your construction services, and set the wages for your government and military employees. Of course, each of these actions has a slew of effects that will impact your entire country, so be careful before you make any changes. You can also view your budget on a state level, states being the regions that make up your country. Finally, on the asset tab, you can view your principal, reserves, and investment pool. Principal is the total size of any loans you have. Loans are automatically created when your country has a negative income and no reserves to fall back on. They are automatically cleared over time when you have a positive income. Of course, ideally, you'd like to avoid going into debt whenever possible, so keep a close eye on your reserves to see when they're running low. Speaking of which, the reserves are just that, how much cash your country has in reserve. Generally, reserves aren't spent on a massive amount of things, as we'll come to in a little moment, and instead are just there to keep you safe during negative income periods. You have a maximum amount of reserves based on your GDP, and when you max out your reserves, you essentially lose the extra income, and this can also have some very negative effects on your economy. So if you max out reserves, try losing some money for the good of your country by doing things such as lowering the tax of your people or increasing the wages of governments and military employees. The investment pool is a pool of cash that can be used to build certain buildings, depending on your economic system, which we'll come back to later during the politics and laws video. This is essentially a way to get your population to pay for buildings rather than your global treasury. Its income is determined by the income of buildings in your country as a portion of profits are taken from anything that's privately owned. Think of it as a billionaire tax that is then used to develop the country. Speaking of buildings, it's our next tab. This is where you can view every single building in your country and change a massive number of settings to adjust production, profits, and more. Along the top, you have four categories of buildings. Urban is any more industrial building. These are your factories that produce more advanced goods, such as weapons, clothes, and tools. It sounds really obvious, but if you think of anything that you'd see in an industrial city in the 1900s, it's gonna be there. Rural is the opposite of this. Anything you'd see outside of a city is there, so farms, logging camps, and mines. These normally produce your less complex or raw goods, which are then used in the production of other things like wood and iron. Development buildings are half military and half infrastructure. You have buildings like barracks and naval bases, which affect your military power. Then for infrastructure, you have ports and railways. Ports produce convoys, which allow you to support and expand trading operations, as well as increase the infrastructure of their state. A railway simply grants a large amount of infrastructure to their state. This infrastructure is another capacity-based system and is consumed by production buildings. Basically, you need to have infrastructure to transport all the goods you produce. Failing to stay in the green will negatively impact that state with worse prices and production for all goods. Finally, the construction tab is where you can see any buildings you currently have in the queue to be built, as well as upgrade your capacity. Construction buildings will always run at loss, so you just have to make sure you can take the hit before expanding operations. It also doesn't matter where you build construction buildings, the capacity is shared across your entire country. That being said, the states where it's built will get a small buff to its speed and efficiency, but it's not enough to worry about it over anything else. 
In any of these tabs, you can see each of the building types you have in your country. By clicking on the name, you can drop down a list of all the states you have these buildings in. You can also see the productivity of all your buildings, and this is just how much economic value a building generates per employee per year. So of course, the higher this is, the better. The squares below the name are the production methods of the building. These can be changed to affect the production of the building, normally via a change in the goods the building consumes or the pops employed there. This can be done in many ways and you'll unlock more through research, so it's worth coming back regularly to see if there's any extra profit to be made. Bear in mind that some method changes will never turn a profit, but will increase your goods production, so are sometimes worth doing if you desperately need a certain good, and as long as you can afford the change, you should be fine. You can also make these changes to every building in your country, or to their individual states, depending on your budget and what is needed. To the right of this, you can expand your buildings of that type, which will bring up the construction menu we'll go into in more depth later. You can subsidize buildings, which basically means the government shoulders any revenue deficit the building might have. This will allow the building to fill its entire staff and maximize production regardless of any cost. This is useful when you desperately need the good regardless of the cost, but ideally you should aim to have every building be profitable eventually, as your economy on the whole will benefit. Finally, you can enable automatic expansion, which will allow the building to automatically queue itself up for expansion when it's producing lots of money and nothing else is being built. This can be useful if you find yourself constantly upgrading a certain building, but be cautious of activating on too many things, which can be tempting. Not everything needs to grow exponentially. I'd stick to basic goods, which you'll always need more of, like farms, ranches, and logging camps. Moving on now to the market tab, this is where you can view the status of every single good produced and consumed by your country. There's a lot of info here, so let's go through the tabs one by one. On the details page, you have every single good listed. The sell and buy orders is basically production and consumption, and the balance is how much you're overproducing or overconsuming. This then affects the market price for your specific country's market, since if there's demand but no production, then the price will be sky high to sell the very limited stock to the highest bidder. Isn't that right, Nvidia? Ideally, you would like every good to be a lower price in your country, since that means all of your pops can buy everything they want and need and will have a higher standard of living. Therefore, you'll have a happier population with an improving GDP. Now, if you have mass supply or demand for a good but can't do anything about it internally, that's where trade routes come in. From here, you can monitor every trade deal happening with your country, whether it's you controlling them or not. At the top of this tab, you also get a list of any goods which would be suitable for importing or exporting, and clicking on one of these options will take you to the trade route creation menu for that good. From here you can see all of your options for creating the trade route, as well as details about each route, like the amount traded and number of convoys needed to support it. On the right you have the most important stat, and honestly the one you'll pay attention to most of the time, productivity. This is how much money the route will bring your country per employee involved, so of course picking the highest value is going to be the best course of action most of the time. In fact this is so important that if this value is in the negative, the game will automatically tell you, hey, you should probably cancel this route because it's not doing anything for you. Hovering over a route, you can get a more detailed breakdown of what it'll do for you, such as the impact on the price of the good on both yours and the other country's market, and the amount of bureaucracy needed to support the deal. Try to pick the best deals for yourself, but be wary of relying too much on a single country for resources, as if they take a disliking to you or are otherwise unable to trade, it can quickly send your economy spiralling. From this menu, you can also set the priority of each good being traded. Doing this encourages the AI to send goods to you or take them from you depending on what you choose and is handy for trying to get more or less of a good that's production is too far to either side. This can have effects on your revenue from that good, so be sure you're not going to take too large financial hits in pursuit of good stability. You can leave this on default most of the time, but if you're too far to either side, it can be a handy extra step to get back in control. At the bottom of this tab, you can also see your available and required convoys, and of course, you'd always like to keep the top number high for continuous expansion and keep your supply network at full strength. Finally, you can see which C nodes you trade in, which pretty much just decides who you can trade with. Finally, on the members tab, you can see every state that's in your market, including those of other countries which share in it. This doesn't affect trade routes and instead allows a good production and consumption to be shared internally as a set as well as a set market price. So in this example, Norway is part of our market, so has the same price of goods that we do, since they partake in the same supply and demand that we do, since it's all in the same internal market. Onto the military tab now. From here, you can see your total number of available battalions, which are your land-based units, as well as where they are based in your country. This is then further broken down into battalions with generals and those in garrison. Generals are displayed just below this and act as the leaders of your armies and allow you to give direct commands to your units whilst you are at war. Each general has a number of traits that affect them in wars and as rulers of political parties if they ever become one. Any unit working under a general will inherit these traits, so battling with generals gives units a huge advantage. If war breaks out, you can mobilize your generals, which will unlock a number of new actions for them, which I'll cover in more detail in the warfare video, but for now we'll go over the basic definitions. Advanced Front will send this army to a front and attempt to advance it to take enemy territory. Fronts are where all your battles take place and are predetermined rather than being created by you, so all you have to do is find them and send your armies there. Defend Front will send them to the front, but instead of taking any land, they will simply attempt to hold their ground and slow enemy advancement. Finally, Stand By will order the army to move back to their HQ, where they will be safe from any attrition. Like I said, wars need their own entire video, so that's all you're getting for now. 
on the fronts and stuff. From this tab, you can also activate conscripts during wartime, which will pull people from your population for the duration of the war to fight for you when you need extra troops, of course, impacting your production of your entire economy, so just be very careful when doing this. Finally, at the bottom of this page, you can recruit new generals in any of your HQs. HQ is just places where you have a large amount of land, so if you have one in America and one in Spain, you might as well recruit a general in America for a war over there, then move one all the way over from Spain. When recruiting a general, you get a selection of your options and can check their rank, political affiliation, traits, and command limit. So you pick the one that works best for your strategic situation and is good to go. On the garrisons tab, you can see how many troops you have garrisoned in your different HQs and the states within those HQs. Troops in garrison have no commander, so cannot be given orders to move to fronts, but will defend their homeland when at war. There's nothing wrong with just having garrisons defending, but troops perform so much better with a commander, so during wartime, it is best to have the majority of your troops working under generals to get the most out of them, and to be able to order them to do what you need. Finally, we have the Navy tab, which is pretty similar to the Army tab, but now it's on water. You get the same info we had on the trade deal page by your supply and trading network. Under this, you'll have a list of admirals, which are commanders of the sea-based units, known as flotillas. These are pretty similar to generals with traits, ranks, and affiliations, but they have their own list of actions they can perform. They can take part in a naval invasion, where they will attempt to open up a new front on an enemy coastline. They have to work with the general to achieve this, so just make sure that you're going to be successful, otherwise it's kind of a waste of both. Raid convoys, which will cause them to weaken an enemy supply network by attacking their convoys on that node. Patrol coastline, which will order them to patrol the coastline of a HQ and destroy enemy vessels they find. And escort convoys, which will send them to protect your trade convoys on a certain shipping node. Our next tab is diplomacy. The first thing you can do from here is view your interests and declare some new ones. Interests are strategic regions in the world that your country wants to be involved in, whether this is by diplomacy, trade or colonization and more. When choosing places to declare your interest, it's best to choose something that would benefit you to interact with in any way, whether it's through invasion or simple interaction with the population. From this screen, you can also view any active wars and diplomatic plays your country is involved in, as well as different diplomatic statuses like trade agreements, alliances and more. On the release subject tab, you can obviously release any subjects or countries you have fully under your control, allowing them to become an independent country, or drop down to a subject of your country if they are an integrated state. You can also choose to play as any country you release, but I'd of course only do this if you're very experienced and looking for a challenge. The technology tab is where you choose what your country is researching. There are three trees, and you can research one technology at a time across all three trees, meaning you have to choose whether to prioritise progress in production, military, or society. As mentioned earlier, you can get progress towards technology from nearby countries, so keep an eye out for progress in useful text to finish them off quickly and unlock some new features. Technology can allow you to do a massive number of things like improve your buildings in new ways, unlock totally new buildings, and create new and more complex products, increase your proficiency in warfare, and unlock new political options and ideologies. As for what to research first, it really does depend on your country and what it needs at the time. But by default, when playing as Sweden, Central Archives is the first pick, and that's a pretty good option to increase your tax and bureaucracy. Pretty much just look at where your country is struggling and search for a tech that can help. If you desperately need more food but don't have any more room for farms, then maybe invest in some agricultural techs to improve the production of existing farms. If you're at war and you're struggling to keep up with the enemy, then maybe research some new and more powerful weapons and troops. The culture tab is where you can view all the different cultures in your country. Along the top, you can see your primary culture and religion, which are your most popular and likely most powerful. Below this, you can see your laws for citizenship and church and state, which can be clicked on to send you to the law screen, where you can change them if they have the option. Below this, on the cultures tab, you have a full up breakdown of the cultures in your country. You can see the culture and religion, amount of turmoil in each group, which is how disruptively unhappy the group is, the group's political strength, and total population. On the Nations tab, you can see any nation formations your country can be a part of. If you have the right technologies or land under your control, you may be able to form a new country that is often more powerful and a higher tier than your own. This can give you a great target if you want to do some warring and you aren't sure where to expand. Just be careful that you don't enrage too many other countries as a large player like this will draw a lot of attention. The Population tab, of course, gives you a ton of information about all the people living in your borders. You can view the essentials along the top with the total population, the number of politically involved pops, which essentially just means the pops with a vote, the average standard of living, and the number of politically inactive pops. Below this, you get your population and their standard of living broken down by their strata. If you notice one group has a lower standard, you can hover over their value, and then hover over the average price of goods to see what's holding them back. I wish I was joking when I was saying this, but this is the easiest way to view this pretty essential tooltip, but it really is. This window pretty much tells you exactly what you need to get more of to improve your standard of living, so be checking on it regularly. By improving more of anything with a large red number, you'll make the standard of living better. Below this, you can get a breakdown of your entire population by profession, culture, and religion. Finally, in the detailed list tab, you can see every type of pop you have in your country, their political interest group, population, and standard of living. Clicking on one of these classes will break them down further into groups based on their culture, religion, and home state. 
This is honestly a little bit too much information, so for now, I just stick to the stratas. The journal will house any missions that come your way. You don't have to complete any of these since it is a sandbox game, but they can give you extra objectives to work towards to progress your country one way or another. At the bottom, you can see a list of potential missions or entries and what needs to happen for them to become active. If you want to head towards a certain political direction or specialization, then checking here for an entry and completing the objectives can be a good first step. In the Decisions tab, you can view some historically significant missions for your country, which can be taken on to unlock powerful buildings and effects for your country and the world. These can be very long missions, so be ready with plenty of resources to see it through to the end. Below the journal, we have the Outliner, and if you played Stellaris before, this should sound familiar. Technically, the Outliner is this area on the right-hand side of the screen that by default shows every general and admiral in your country. By clicking on the small star next to any of the values shown in the Outliner tab, you can pin them to the right-hand side of the screen so they are always visible. This can be handy, for example, if you want to monitor what the market is doing and quickly head to the trading menu quite often. If you find yourself checking on something a lot, why not pin it to save yourself some clicks? Finally, on this left-hand side, we have the map list. This lists every single country in the game and a massive amount of info about each. You can see the overall rank and prestige level, your rank is determined by your prestige and you earn prestige basically by being a successful country with a high GDP, large military power and more. Speaking of which, you can also see each country's GDP, average standard of living and population. You don't really need to look at this too much other than to check how other countries are doing, perhaps before getting involved in more conflicts. The last thing you want is entering a war with a rank 1 when you're in the 20s. Finally, we're moving on from the left hand side of the screen, which is by far the most detailed, to the bottom, which is a little bit simpler. First is easy, the location finder. This is literally just a search bar that allows you to type in the name of any state or country in the game if you can't find it on the map. Then we have the five lenses. Each of these has two functions. The first is to show different things on the map, such as your most productive areas. Second is to perform certain actions, like expanding production or various diplomatic plays and actions. Our first lens is production. This shows which regions have the highest GDP and are contributing the most to your overall GDP score. From this menu, you can expand your production for any resource you're producing internally by clicking on them along the bottom of the screen. This will bring up the construction menu where you can choose where to build, as well as see the states, any level of the same construction they already have, available labor, predicted earnings per employee, and the overall predicted earnings upon completion. Generally, I just sort by predicted earnings and pick whichever has the highest and has some available labor. Next, we have the political lens, which shows you your political strength. Next, we have the political lens, which shows you where your political strength resides, as well as a breakdown of each of the interest groups in your country and their clout. Clout is basically their share of political strength, so how much they get a say in what laws are passed. With this lens, you can do a number of actions. You can expand government buildings like construction, admin, and universities. You can issue decrees which kind of like commandments and toll war. They're just effects you can place on states that grant them buffs to certain areas at the cost of authority. These can be useful when getting a state under control by using them for a short while until the root of the issue is fixed before turning them back off. And finally, you can perform state actions such as incorporating states that aren't fully into your nation and moving your capital. The diplomatic lens shows every other country's relation towards yours, basically giving you a quick breakdown of who's friends and who you need to be worried about. Along the bottom, you can perform a number of actions. Region actions allow you to declare interests, which we covered a little earlier, and establish colonies, which allow you to enter a decentralized or very weak and unorganized nation and settle there. This starts out with a single province in a state and expands out over time, raising tensions with the nation as it does. You can perform a number of diplomatic plays which are essentially stating what you want to do to a state or country and more often than not leads to war. Most of these are pretty self-explanatory as long as you're up to date on your wartime vocabulary. They all just determine your war goals for the conflict, like freeing countries, making them your subjects one way or the other, or forcing them to do what you want. Diplomatic actions are a little less drastic to more so affect the day-to-day -day interactions between countries. These are things such as various trade packs, defensive packs, relation manipulations, and voluntary subjugation. The military lens shows you your active wars, allies, and enemies. Along the bottom, you can build more barracks and naval bases, activate conscripts, and recruit generals and admirals. And finally, we have the trade lens. This will show you the different markets and their interactions with each other, as well as any infrastructure problems in your own country. Along the bottom, you can construct more construction sectors or ports, move your market capital, and establish import and export trade routes. Finally, finally, we have the map modes, where you can see how each country fares in a large number of criteria, like migration, GDP, and more. And finally, we get to the right-hand side of the screen, I promise we're nearly done. As mentioned before, you have the outliner, which can contain a variety of different information based on what you choose to pin. You'll also have any conflicts you're involved in pinned here, so you can keep an eye on how they're going if they need any attention. You can pin journal entries to monitor your progress on missions, you can view your construction queue, and finally you have the date and time controls. And last but not least, at the bottom right you also have a rolling list of recent world events which will keep you informed on what's going on in your world and country. 
And that is all for today on the resources and use interface of Victoria 3, but we've got an economy guide coming next, so subscribe if you want to see that. Like the video if you enjoyed it or found it useful, and leave a comment of any questions you have, I'll do my best to help you out. If you're feeling especially big penis and want to support the channel directly, you can do so by becoming a member on YouTube or a patron on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shoutouts at the end of videos like Henry Tucker and Flickr for their support at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters, one last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Danders, and I will see you next turn.